on the first day of Christmas. Dude Love Show to me, Stu Hart's kid with a bad knee. On the second day of Christmas, Dude Love Show to me, two Yerbal Hugs and Stu Hart's kid with a bad knee. On the third day of Christmas, Dude Love Show to me, three man band, two Yerbal Hugs and Stu Hart's kid with a bad knee. On the fourth day of Christmas, Dwayne, Dude Love Show to me, four horsemen, three man band, two Yerbal Hugs and Stu Hart's kid with a bad knee. On the fifth day of Christmas, Dude Love Show to me, five wrestling rings, Man, four this, what, what, this what, what, what? Christmas song you're doing. It's not a Christmas song, but it says here it's really important. Someone named Dwayne, and the most important thing to me is Christmas. Dwayne, I'm so sorry I ruined it. I hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. And have a nice day. Wow. Was not expecting that. Dwayne, I am so sorry that mankind got confused, but he did it out of the goodness of his heart. It says here that you have a movie that has just come out, Black Adam. <laughs> so this, is, wait. <laughs> this, is not, this is the Dwayne, uh, the Dwayne, Dwayne. <laughs> Listen, it's the hardcore legend uh, Mick Foley, and so nice of you to think of me. I'm already playing a little role. Thanks for the extra screen time on this year's uh, uh, episodes of Young Rock, uh, brother. <laughs> your friendship. That's what you said, brother. Your friendship means so much to me. I'm right back at you. Your friendship means so much to me. And uh, even though it's not in here, I hope I'm not spoiling anything. Don't let the children see this. But it is such an honor to uh, write the Santa letter for your children and to do the uh, yearly video. And uh, I consider it an honor to be part of your yearly Christmas tradition and uh, I am aware that you have a movie out, and I'm so glad it's doing well. Thank you, my friend, for your support over the years. Every year on the uh, anniversary of that day that I defeated you, and I technically defeated you twice. It was a feat so nice, I did it twice. But you're always the guy putting it out there. It's uh, the anniversary of that time, and you were proud to do it. Changed my career. And brother, we were pretty good as a tag team. So to young Dwayne out there, thank you so much for thinking of me. May all your days be nice. Well, so there you what go. What a surprise that is, huh? How about a little cameo for the biggest wow, star in the world? Incredible, whoa. Definitely not a commercial, uh, but just a reminder, a public service announcement, if you will, that you too can support Mick Foley for the cameo and bring a little uh, joy to someone's life. I just want to remind everybody that at cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley, as we're recording this, Mick has 4,381 five-star reviews the most decorated cameo superstar <laughs> in all of sports entertainment and all of sports for that matter. And, uh, you two can, uh, send the gift that keeps on giving cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. And even, uh, even the biggest star in the world needs a little pick me up every now and again. Sure does. I really enjoyed that. And I'm really, I'm really, I mean, I guess this is kind of a commercial for the cameos, but I, I really try hard. And I think if you go to my, go to that website, uh, cameo.com slash Mick Foley and you look at the reviews and you look at the videos it's pretty clear that I enjoy them on a level that most people don't and it really means a lot to me that it's uh, you choose me to bring uh, home and put a smile on someone's face check it out cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley and we're glad you guys are checking out our show today of course we normally end with a cameo we're starting with one this yeah. week uh, because well we're gonna be talking about some pretty serious subject matter I can't believe this is true, but as we're, as folks are listening to this, we're just a few days away from the 25th anniversary of one of the most landmark things in mm -hmm. wrestling history, the Montreal screw job. Crazy. It feels like it's been discussed forever and ever, but whenever anyone tells that story, 
They always include your part, and uh, now we're going to get to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, pardon the pun. It's pretty captivating. Now, let me say, uh, as a thank you to all of you out there, is that uh, this story is pretty well told. Yeah. And we do take strolls down memory lane, and the truth is, you as a listener have an option to take those strolls with any one of a number of wrestling luminaries. Yes. And I think sometimes it comes down to who you want to be your guide. Right. And so uh, for those of you who choose me as your guide, it is very much appreciated. I know it's a crowded field and uh, we're doing pretty, pretty, pretty good. And that's all on you guys. So thank you. And uh, even though most of you know this story, Perhaps I can uh, offer a little insight because I was there and I played a little role, you know, especially in the aftermath. And uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to this episode. I am pumped about it. Uh, I never get tired of talking about this story. And uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Of course, last month we talked about Brian Pillman and his death. We had talked a lot about uh, bad blood and uh, just what everything was going on in the company here in, in, in the fall of 1997. Of course, we saw at that pay-per-view the debut of Hell in a Cell, which you came to know a thing or two about. Uh, and, of course, Kane debuted in such a monster fashion, one of the biggest debuts of all time. But the next night, we're at Kemper Arena for Raw. And, of course, Shotgun is taped before the show. And here you're going to be working with Jose Estrada Jr. as Dude Love. And that show maybe is most remembered for Billy Gunn and Road Dog forming their tag team, mm. which is obviously going to become uh, something else you're pretty aware of pretty darn aware of that's right um but that night there's a bit of controversy vince mcmahon interviews melanie pillman just a day after the world learns that brian was gone in hindsight boy that was maybe not the best call did you feel weird about it when it was happening i did yeah uh yeah i did it just uh... I, I, you know, I mean, I think it was done with good intentions. I just don't think any grieving widow should be interviewed for anything. Yeah. I, and I know uh, all the time, you know, the news flocks around and tries to get words from someone who's lost somebody. Uh, but I do believe that that person should be left alone and, and to mourn in their way, in a way that doesn't involve doing an interview on live national television. I know it's in fashion to take pot shots at Vince McMahon. I'm not intending to do that here. I'm just trying to understand. What do you think the upside was? Was he trying to do a little damage control for the company? Did he think it was good for ratings? I just, I'm really wondering, like, what is the upside for interviewing Melanie? Because I don't really see one. Uh, maybe I'm naive to think that he was trying to give her a platform. A, a platform. Uh, Vince did try to. I think he tried to finesse in a little anti-drug message, and it's still cloudy. You know, I Brian died of a, a heart issue. Yes, but uh, I don't think there's much argument that he was over medicating. Over medicating at the time, and uh, I do remember it being incredibly uncomfortable to watch. And would not have been my call, but I, I'm of the belief that it was done with good intentions. So this is also an interesting night because really for the first time we see the click do the curtain call from the MSG show in 1996. It's going to become something that's at least discussed on television and shown on TV for the first time. It almost feels like for that to have been such a hot button issue a year prior, one year later, Boy, Vince has sort of done an about face with his approach to the business and pulling back the curtain. You know, this is in October is the month, I believe, where he goes on TV and says, or maybe it was November, but he came on TV and said something like, we're no longer going to insult your intelligence about good guys mm -hmm. versus bad guys. Are you shocked to see Vince do this seemingly about face about what was okay for prime time and what's not? No, because it was the day after Brian's death. Uh, at that Monday Night Raw that he gathered the, uh, the crew around and more or less announced that uh, the, the old days were over. That if we were going to connect with the audience, it was going to be on the performers to bring out more of themselves. So I had talked uh, many times about that meeting being what I see as the dawn of the Attitude Era. 
That was the night that gave birth. Uh, they were clearly glimpses of the atti you know, attitude yet to come, and Steve Austin was all about the attitude before there was officially an era. But it was only in the last couple months that I did learn that this was the talk he gave the night after Brian died. So I don't think we saw another vocation performer after that. Uh, that was kind of the end of people being, <laughs> being job descriptions. And it allowed people to be, bring in more of themselves. So for a guy like the Road Dog, who is so naturally gifted uh, with wit, yes. that was you know that was part of the reason. Now also him and him and Billy just gelled uh, together as a tag team. At the same time, like you said, Vince is allowing the uh, the 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 curtain call to be talked about, which is fueling Triple H's renewed push where he's, he goes out of being the Greenwich Blue Blood, he becomes the badass Triple H, and that is, that, that's in motion so that uh, when we get in uh, f four months later to uh, WrestleMania 1998, we see the, the formation of the new DX, yep. which with all due respect to Shawn Michaels, who is, you know, we've sung his praises high and loud and deservingly so, but the new, the new DX is the DX. Yeah. Right, they've got you know Sean Waltman arriving, and Billy and Road Dog uh, joining the crew, and now Triple H is leading a group of uh, of amazing talent with China, China. with yeah. China, yeah. and so that goes on to be one of the resounding successes of the Attitude Era. So Jim Cornette is cutting these crazy promos on TV in this era, where he's just sort of addressing the State of the Union for wrestling. And it's almost like a, a shoot promo, if you will. He's saying that there's not enough Ric Flair or Arn Anderson or Mick Foley on TV. Mm. Maybe there's too much NWO. Do you know that he's going to say that stuff, or do you find out from watching a monitor or after the fact? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not sure Jimmy knows what he's going to say until right. he does it. Can we just take a moment for me to just suggest to Jimmy, who still loves wrestling and is one of the finest managers our business has ever known, Please do a stint in AEW. Please show up on the air. Give your tutelage to someone on that roster or a couple people on that roster. I know you hate the company, but you love the business. Yeah. It's like Tommy Lazorda in that commercial was trying to get the Cubs fan out of the tree. And he's like, I know you love the Cubs, but you love baseball more. Yeah. Come on and watch the World Series. Like, Jimmy, this is almost like we talked in last week's episode about the lack of push for Becky Lynch yes. actually serving as the build to her turn. Yeah. Jimmy Cornette talking truth, he might hate AEW, but he doesn't hate everybody in AEW. No. And could you imagine the type of heat? You'd have to go back in time 30 years or more to get that type of heat. I, I think it would be tremendous. I think it, six weeks is all we ask. Six weeks, Jimmy, looking at the camera. Six weeks, you owe it to the business. All right, now we can continue our podcast. Remind me to tell you a story off here. I will, okay. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about Jim in the, in the next few weeks. I think you're going to be uh, pretty entertained with what we have up our sleeves. Right. But the next night is uh, the Raw taping in Topeka, Kansas. And here you are again on Shotgun, <laughs> defeating Sultan as Dude Love. Sultan has the Iron Sheik on the outside of the ring. It feels like everybody <laughs> in wrestling has a great Iron Sheik story. Do you have one? Oh man, I, the, my chic stories are the things I talked about in my book, the things that I overheard with chic finding out he tested positive on a drug test and saying, "Oh, beautiful baby," without realizing positive, That's not good. positive isn't a positive thing, and also him uh, not being treated the way he thought the Iron Sheik should in WCW in a house show match with Vader, and he comes back. He goes, "Who does he think that is? That jabroni?" Treating the Iron Sheik, and then Leon walks in. He goes, "Beautiful baby, loved it." <laughs> I do, I do remember Sheik like driving. He had that awful ankle, right? Yes. Didn't even look human. Uh, so he would get the cart that would take him around in the uh, airport, and so he had me hop on the cart. And they usually just say beep, 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 and Sheik is going, "Get out of the way! Are you deaf, brother?" 
<laughs> I love it. I need to see that. <laughs> the way. So he was a character. He, he, you know, he still is a character. Uh, I know that a, I think a couple people run his account, you know. Yeah, nice guys. But it's given him uh, a second lease in life. You know, uh, and then we all need that. I've got mine. You know, I do my thing here in a cameo, but that type of thing, uh, you know, helped Cheek. I really, I was glad that I was part of his documentary. Rock was part. Yeah. The same Dwayne Johnson I did the the cameo for. Yeah. He was part of it, and I was I was tentative about doing it because I I wasn't. I felt like maybe he was being um, manipulated. Manipulated. Um, and I wasn't comfortable with that. I wasn't really comfortable with that manipulation. But when I got in there, especially after I saw how highly Dwayne talked about him, I ended up being a small, but I think pretty important part of that. So I don't have a lot of chic stories. I did wrestle him in uh, the Isle of Dominica. Did he have to break your back and humble you? I, he did. I, I, no, he, he did not make me form an arch either. Yes. Okay. So there, yeah, no, he did not humble me in that manner. But believe it or not, there was a large Muslim population in Dominica. Uh, and that would be significant. That night uh, would be uh, the first time I uh, did the deed um, since I was in college. And I do recall that when I brought out my prophylactic, it crumbled in my hands and I didn't know rubbers crumbled. So that will give you how an idea. How long had you been carrying how long? that? I've been carrying that since uh, since uh, eighty five. And what year was this? Eighty eight. Was Indiana Jones on the hunt for it? <laughs> oh my maybe, gosh! What an artifact! Wrestling treasures should cover that. The hunt for the lost Foley condom. So it just crumbled. In that three year period, it was what we might call a dry spell, dry or spell. were you just backing up? It was a combined uh, dry spell, and I was conveniently giving up sex every Lent because it was relatively easy to give up something you weren't Weren't getting. (laughs) Yeah. I get it. I understand. Boy, Mrs. Foley is a a wonderful woman. (laughs) My goodness. Guys, I got to tell you, I just ended a 25 year relationship with DirecTV. I finally cut the cord. It's been like 25 years and I just found, man, with all these new, uh, subscription services that were out there, all these streaming services, I just wasn't using it that much. But then as if that wasn't enough, once I got into cost saving mode, I signed up for something called true bill and boy, I found I was paying for all kinds of subscription service that I signed up for at the start of the pandemic. And the wife and I just weren't using it anymore. That's why I love using rocket money formerly known as Truebill. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Well, about 80% of folks have subscriptions they forgot about. I was one of those. Maybe it's an unused Amazon Prime account or a Hulu account that just never gets streamed. Well, there's a great app I use that helps track all of my expenses. And because of that, I no longer waste money on subscriptions. I don't even use. Now you might've heard of it. It's called Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. Now you might be thinking, how much does that really going to save me. Well, most Americans think they spend like 80 bucks a month, buddy. It's closer to $200 plus. That's right. You could be wasting hundreds of dollars each month on stuff you don't even know about. The app shows you all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you, whatever you don't still want. Rocket money can even find subscriptions. You didn't even know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. I did that. I signed up for one card or one service with a card. My wife signed up for the same service with a different card. It wasn't until we had this that we discovered, Hey, we don't need two of those accounts to cancel a subscription. All you have to do is press cancel and rocket money takes care of the rest. How easy is that? Get rid of useless subscriptions with rocket money. Now go to rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Seriously. It could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Uh, so Kane's assuring people. And also there was the word spoken. Let me just say one word and uh, people at home 
can either shake their ha heads in agreement, because uh, I think a lot of us has been through, the one word that sticks out in my mind was, already? <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, that's what I wanted to ask, I guess. Like, what happens when uh, the, the circumstance, I assume, that you pulled from your wallet crumbles in your hand? Yeah. I took a bareback riding lesson, uh, and uh, just hopefully it was, the best. A, it was a brief lesson. Yeah, brief. Yeah, brief. Yeah. Well, squash matches are important too. They tell stories. Uh, I don't know what we're doing anymore. Kane is destroying people like the Hardys and Flash Funk. Uh, what do you think of this Kane character once you actually see oh, it get up man. and going? Man, when it think? when it debuted, it was a tough. Oh, it was a tough situation to debut in. Because Brian Pillman, we've learned of Brian's death, yep. and also uh, The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels are having a classic for the ages that ends in a unpopular manner. I mean, similar to what Shawn and I did at Mind Games, ah, wouldn't it have been better off to have a winner and a loser? But none of us knew that this was a character that was going to stand the test of time still be over in you know that was that was 20 23 years ago 23 years later i mean 20, uh, 20, 20, 20 years, 26 25, 25, 25 because yeah. it was 1997 sorry yeah. about that 25 years later different incarnations a lot of it due to glenn uh imbuing in that character a sense of uh, by turns humanity and audacity and uh, and I like Glenn. I mean, Glenn and I had uh, wrestled uh, my lone time in uh, Puerto Rico. I knew him a little bit from my uh, uh, stint in Smoky Mountain. He was a good guy. And actually, we were rooming together on the night of the Montreal screw job, even though we were opposing each other. So I was really happy for Glenn. Uh, it was clear that Dr. Isaac Yankum uh, not going anywhere. Uh, not going anywhere followed up by the bogus diesel terrible didn't go anywhere it almost made his stint as the christmas creature where he was dressed as a giant christmas tree in memphis were you jealous of that no if you're going to do something christmasy do it well or don't do it at all do you think the christmas creature and santa claus could have been a one-off tag team no they could have been one-off rivals because he was an evil christmas creature santa claus could fix that can we find that on youtube oh yes Okay. We can cue that beautiful bean footage right now of the Christmas creature. <laughs> but I, I mean, I do think, like, what a cool story that could be, maybe for a charity show in Knoxville, maybe one day. <laughs> Not saying you're going to do a real match, but Santa and the Christmas creature Santa. again. Who would be tougher to sell? You on doing one last match, even if it was with a Christmas tree, or the mayor dressing up like a Christmas tree? That's a tough uh, sell. The one, the match I proposed, and it would have been a cinematic match was uh, 2013, Santa versus Mick Foley. Oh, wow. Yes. Shot in a way, and it would just leave just so, obviously tongue-in-cheek for those not in the magic age, but for those who were, it wouldn't be so obvious. So we're thinking different camera angles. I wanted to do something involving a three-man band uh, I cannot remember why Three Man Band, other than I was a big fan of theirs. And uh, I wanted Santa. They had been working with Legends. In yeah, the yeah, they, yeah, yeah, that's right. I wanted Santa on commentary, bad mouthing me, Mick Foley, and me not taking kindly to it, thinking I had it in me to stand up to Santa, who would say, like, oh, you fell off of a cell. Well, whoop de doo, I traveled to, you know. 97 million homes in a, whatever, 400 million homes in a single. Santa was going to stand his ground, sure. uh, his grounds for being, and it never happened. Uh, it would have been a heck, it would have been a cinematic match, and I believe it, it could have been good. Yeah, I'm sure it could have, because he could have pulled all kinds of gimmicks out of the sack. Would have been awesome. And as it turns out, 2013, uh, I, that's another story for another day. I'm going to get, I'm going to get, too far off track. Too far off track. I know we like the segues and the, the little uh, sidebars. sidebars I go on. This one wouldn't be worth the distance we would go to get it. Well, I'm curious about the Kane character. Do you look at that and think, hey, man, I just made a bunch of money with The Undertaker. Here's another guy I can work with like that. Or not so much. 
It just feels like a big character that yeah. Mankind could work with. Well, none of us knew how well that character was going to do. That's true. I think I was taking a wait and see approach. Uh, I mean, I didn't really know what was in the cards for me there because I had, you know, as we talked about the three faces of Foley, um, who were now all established, and that I took umbrage with the idea that uh, people would be dogging dude for his lack of expertise when that was the idea all along. And now it brings us to a situation where dude love is manhandled by Kane and uh, we need a stronger version. We need a stronger face of Foley to counteract what Kane has done because dude's not gonna get it done. No duding up in the world is going to make him an equivalent of Kane. I'm so glad you said duding up because I want to ask you about going on this California loop, working with Owen Hart. <laughs> it leads to a pretty legendary story. Meltzer is even there to see it. He had this to say, dude, love beat Owen Hart in 11 minutes and two seconds in a false count anywhere match with Austin doing the stunner on Owen for the finish. And there's cartoon violence with Hart selling such brutal maneuvers as being hit with a piece of carpet <laughs> and a huge bag of popcorn. <laughs> pretty bad and you know that dave Meltzer's there you know he's in the front row and you and owen are deciding we're going to make it our mission to try to make steve break character yeah. and laugh and and you figure uh, is it are uh, you throw in the dave Meltzer factor is that going to distract us take us off that route no of course not no it temporarily we thought it might oh, wait, uh, wait, maybe people are going to read about this yeah i'm going to read ah, about it and say hey everyone. you know what let's make it even worse yes than usual because the night before in anaheim we nearly gotten steve to crack when i i dumped a box of soft drink lids <laughs> onto owen so i didn't just hit him with it i like threw it up in the air and these things are fluttering down with floating. all the floating, like with all the menace of a monarch butterfly. And Owen's knees, knees are buckling. He's doing the like the Memphis stagger. This is not something that Calgary would have put a stamp of approval no. on. But Owen gravitated towards the funny stuff anyway. Yes. He was yes. incredible in that he could have he could tear the house down or he could stink it up, and he did it with equal enthusiasm. So we had almost gotten there, and, uh, and, and, and he was like, hey, what do you say? Are we going to have Crack Steve? And I go, I don't know. Meltzer's here tonight. And then I heard my own words, like, we're going to alter our match for, for anyone, yeah, whether it's Dave Meltzer or anyone else. Like, let's find some gimmicks. Like, uh, and then when I found the big Santa sack, industrial-sized sack of popcorn, I realized I thought we had what it took to... Uh, to make Steve break, and uh, sure enough, it, it, the the popcorn, the knees buckling. Uh, Owen took over on offense. It appeared that Dude Love was just wildly thrashing around. But what I was doing, Conrad, is I wasn't popcorn thrashing. Popcorn angels. Popcorn angel. So I got up, and remember, you know, we're selling these sons of bitches out almost every night. Yes. So the further away you are from the ring, the more obvious it is that a this is an angel. angel with a big ass. And Steve saw that, and we look over at Steve, and he's got his hand. He's trying to kayfabe the laugh, but his, his face is bright red, and his lats the stomach are, is shaking. The lats are shaking. Not the stomach. The lats are shaking like this. And later on, that's what I would see in the front in first class when I was writing "Have a Nice Day." Be like, "Kid, you got some more of that book I can read?" And I would hand him a notebook, and he'd be up there in first class, just belly laughing while these businessmen with their attaché cases are like, "What the bleep is going on here?" So Steve, he like to this day, he got a great infectious laugh. Yes. And when he when he said, I think he took his hands away from his face and he went, "You guys are the shits." Yes. And that meant more. I wish Dave instead of saying pretty bad had given it like negative five stars, but it was so bad it was good. And most people there, you know, I'd say most people they were entertained. It, yeah, they were entertained. I, I love you had a quote in your book about this. Um, as Bill Alfonso might have said, it's his constitutional right to stink up the building if he so desires. What a great line. Is that a Bill Alfonso line? Bill Alfonso said, it's the missing tape so you'll never see it. It's the great missing ECW show. It's, we, we 
followed up uh, the November to remember with uh, we preceded with an October to forget. So that okay. was the missing tape. That was the night of the fire. But the the storyline there was I was going to put Tommy Dreamer through everything that I had done. When he forces the hardcore out of me, yes. he's going to come to regret it. And one of the things I was going to do, I was going to bust him open the hard way. Tommy thought that because I had been the recipient of more people in the modern era, I think, of the old school hard way, than anybody, because I'd had uh, uh, Fuller as a mentor, whose father was a master at it, Terry Funk as a mentor, whose father was a master at it. Don't try it at home or at a show, but it's not about boom, it's about punching down, boom. So it's not the- Tearing the skin. Tearing the skin, bam, so you just have that eyebrow, and boom, and nothing looked more believable, especially in the days when believability was a big thing than a guy with that wound, you know? Even when people got smart to the Eddie Mansfield, to this day I don't like to use the word blade. Uh, I would rather give it another pseudonym, but to this day, people got wise to that, but brother, how, this the big split over the eyebrow? It's real. It's pretty tough to argue. Uh, Tommy incorrectly made the assumption that because I'd been on the receiving end of hard ways, that I knew how to deliver one, which was not the case. So he gets ready for the hard way, and you can see him summing it up. Like, and that first one doesn't even come near his eyebrow. I think it hits him in the, gives him a shiner under the eye. <laughs> sorry, but, sorry. Here I come with the other one. I'm trying to punch down, and now I'm catching him on the temple. And now there's like six or seven punches. None of them do anything with his eyebrow. And he's not crying because he's a baby. He's crying because he's also been punched in the nose, which creates tears. And he looks up at me through his tears and goes, would you please stop punching me? <laughs> and so now, even though none of those did the trick it's supposed to, after we've seen Tommy legitimately suffering, I'm doing what I call, this is the Terry Gordy punch. One of the best workers in the world and threw an amazing punch, and it's partially because of the, the wind-up. Yes. The cool thing is, like, UFC, we know, and in boxing, a lot of your power comes he from here to here, boom, right? And there's a lot of torque in the core and all that stuff. We don't bring it from here to here in wrestling. We bring it from here back to here, shaking the hand and using the offhand if you can, like you're rolling dice in there and then, brother, you bring it, it's clearly a working punch. Yes. And yet I sell my hand as if I've broken every, every bone in it, and then I start to leave, and the referee gets on the <laughs> microphone, got this Jack, why are you being such a pussy? Because I say I want to be, count me out, oh, I can't, count, call off the match, because we don't have we don't end matches here. Count me out. Count me out. We don't do that. He says, why are you being such a pussy? And then Bill comes in. Don't remember if he had the whistle yet or not. He's got a book in his hands that he claims is the Pennsylvania State Athletic, Athletic Commission rule book. And he says, not only is it in the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission rule book, it is his constitutional right to be counted out if he wants. Terry Funk gets up in his face and he goes, Terry Fung, I don't care. And then Terry goes, if you say one more word, I'm going to knock your goddamn dick in the dirt. And he goes, Terry, and boom, and you can be assured, left hand. That was not a downward, you know, hard way punch. This is Terry Funk with his working punch, which is going to kill a man. And then the, yeah, the Raven straps the five pound weight on my, uh, he tapes it. I kick a field goal with Terry's genitalia. Tommy dives on top of Terry, mayhem ensues, there's a riot, <laughs> and we get sued six years later. So it was a pretty memorable. This is the fire show? This is the fire show. Yeah, we got to tell the whole story some other time. Some other time. We'll By the way, I just want to mention, for a guy who last week was talking about concussions. Yeah. You remember that shit pretty vividly. Long term, brother. And and it is also the things that made an impression on me. Yeah. And luckily, we are hitting on things that made an impression. Last week, there was a match you asked me about. I was like, yeah. I don't know. Well, here's yeah. the here's the trick. We've got to find a way to set something on fire or get you sued every day. And long term, we're in business. <laughs> you know, really, when you think about it. Uh, so, listen, there's lots of backstage drama. That seemingly is maybe sucking some of the fun out of the WWF in this era. We talked a lot about the fun you're having on some of the. the Can I get Grillo to throw me a beverage like a water? Yeah, drink? I think we yeah. should. We should have as as Taz would call it, water break Jones. 
where just water magically appears on the program for our mutual enjoyment. But as we're doing that, okay. I want to ask about, you're having fun with Owen. Mm -hmm. There's lots of silliness, shenanigans and whatnot. But all right, we're back here. Uh, I, I think Grillo has, has knocked down the cameras. Uh, poor I have one on last sip of the Black Adam. Black Adam, I hope he's... I hope he's doing well. I hope he's pulling for us. I do want to talk about a serious subject, though, because, yeah. man, you're having fun with Owen. You're having fun with Steve. It feels like the company is 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 pu pulling in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you first joined this company, they're not exactly selling out every night. Houses are getting bigger. But as a company, you're still getting demolished by the competition. Yeah. And as we all know, in September, when Cactus Shack makes his debut, that's when we know that Vince McMahon sits down with Brett and says, Hey, I can't honor that contract. I gave you just 11 months ago. And now there's been all kinds of drama through the summer with Brett and Sean and Vince is kind of in the middle of all this. Uh, you finally come back to raw and Meltzer would have this to say, dude, love was in the ring and Kane came out and destroyed him with two choke slams on the ramp. Kane didn't sell anything, including a chair to the head. The Kane gimmick is going to get over huge. Later in the show, dude did an interview as Mankind challenging Kane to a match. Do you see the uh, the problems with Brett and Sean, the injury with um, The Undertaker, because he's been wrestling hurt, uh, and, and now we see that Steve is down for real. Do you see this as a potential opportunity for you to have another main event run is mankind because just a couple of weeks ago you're working uh shotgun matches with the sultan <laughs> and now well you've got an opportunity with kane as mankind well, we not are, dude well, love. well here i did not know about the uh the tension backstage i, I don't think i was privy to the uh well, you know about the hair pulling and the fighting. I did and know the about unsafe. that. I did know about that. The I know the sunny days, the uh, the hair pulling, um, but I was not aware, especially when these guys started tearing the house down together in Montreal. I was not aware that it was going to affect their working relationship. Uh, I think the to me the most shocking aspect that I learned in the aftermath is that Brett would not put. He did not want to put Shawn Michaels over, but he volunteered to put me over. I was on his short list of three people, me, Steve, and maybe one other person that he would put over for the WWE title. Um, but when it came to Kane and Dude, uh, this is where we go back to the idea that there is a pecking order. Yes. And that Dude is the bottom of that ladder. He's yep. the fun guy. And uh, and I think mankind maybe even said he was just a kid. He was just a kid. So now he's standing up for him. And we know on one level that it's ridiculous that I am clearly both people. Right. But I'm not acting like I know that I'm both people. And this is where we willingly suspend disbelief so that wrestling fans can say, oh, this is a different story. But I believe I knew that my job as mankind was to put this new character over strong. That we were going to, this is where the, the three face of Foley thing I think is really helpful is that, okay, you destroy dude love to notch in your belt, but here comes mankind and now you're gonna convincingly beat the tougher uh, version of Mick Foley. And the choke slam on the ramp, your idea? Yeah. Uh, cho people don't realize how difficult a choke slam is. Not in that it's difficult to pull off. It's difficult in the sense that even when it's done correctly, you're landing on a small surface area. You are landing on part of your back, and you're hoping it's right under, right by the shoulder blades down to the small of your back. But if you're off by just a little bit, you land too high. That's an issue. You land too low, that's an issue. You land to either side, especially on a ramp, that's an issue. Uh, I mean, I remember just taking a plane choke slam. This is pre, um, 
reconfigured rings. Yeah, before so, Vince was Right, working. right. So the 1996 ring I debuted in, uh, it was a tough ring to take a choke slam on to the point where I was working Undertaker. I don't know if it was TV or not, but I remember he gave me a choke slam in the ring, safe one, but for whatever reason, I start feeling all this warmth come up through my esophagus, tins in my mouth, and I think I described it in my book as feeling like uh, Dizzy Gillespie on a hot trumpet solo, where I'm like this because my mouth is full of blood. Oh, wow. Internal blood. And I made it through the match. You know, I guess I felt like they didn't want to see that right. at that era. And as soon as I made a beeline for the dressing room and spewed it. So it, in the end of that time, I wouldn't have told anybody. I would not have asked for medical attention. I, I was, I was still under the impression that I was the king of the death match, capable of doing anything. And here I am nearly destroyed by a single choke slam. So I tell that story just to put the onus on the importance of a choke slam on a ramp. So there is one way that I, 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 I some, well, occasionally, not often, but finish off one of my one-man shows with that story. I don't want to give away the, uh, the, the key line that takes us home. But the truth, and this is a Shiazut brother, is someone from the, the crew brought me up to the ramp, whether it was the next day or the next week, and said, like, do you see that? I said, yeah. They said, do you know what that is? I said, it looks like a dent. And then he told me the alloy of the metal that didn't bend or didn't dent. And so Kane's choke slam, even though I saw it on social media a couple weeks ago, it didn't look like that big of a deal. And I didn't get that much height because I usually did get decent height, even for a guy who had no spring in his step. That's a difficult, difficult bump to take. I think anyone who's ever taken it, you know, on a ramp outside the floor would tell you the same thing. But even in the old days, in 1997, taking a choke slam was a serious proposition. And I took one almost every night that I wrestled Undertaker. Choke slam followed by the uh, tombstone. Followed by the tombstone. And I always tried to get the uh, the the tried to get some height for him, and I usually did. Uh, but that to me was an important. That was an important match because I do I did understand that I'd been getting a good push, uh, that people had been doing favors for me, making my stuff look good, and I took a lot of pride in making uh, Glenn's stuff look good. Man, is there anything better than a Blue Chew commercial here on Folius Pod? Come on. It's time for your hot tag for your wiener. Guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. And just how far can that confidence take you? Well, what if you could wear sweatpants on TV and pull a sock puppet out of your drawers and beat grown men with it? That's what it worked for Mick Foley. And you can do it too. Come on. Blue chew is going to make you feel like it's time to throw that mandible claw down. Hit her with that bang, bang. Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime, day or night, and you can be dude in the head or dude it up. Whenever an opportunity arises. Now the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, man, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it have better sex y'all we've got a special deal for our listeners try blue chew free when you use our promo code foley at checkout just pay five dollars shipping that's bluechew.com the promo code is foley to receive your very first month for free visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information and we thank blue chew for sponsoring the podcast bang bang compare and contrast taking a choke slam on the ramp to taking a power bomb on concrete well, you can protect a guy with a power bomb, um, but at the time where Leon White gave me the power bomb on the floor in WCW, this may be a more in-depth story for another time. We had a history where Leon had temporarily paralyzed. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, young Joe Thurman, and he, and he did come back. Leon visited him in the hospital, crying like a, you know, when I say crying like a baby, I mean rightfully so, just to dispel, dispel the idea that he didn't care about the kid because right. he did. But, you know, when you're trying to make it look good, uh, we, we all saw that independent scene where the guy's head just bounced off the mat three times. Yeah. You know, and Ricky Morton talked to the guy who said his opponent wanted it, asked for it. And that changes the perspective, but now you have to sit down with both those guys and say... Don't do that. Don't do that. It's just stupid. And if somebody asks you to do something that's going to lead them... Uh, don't to, do it. You don't do it. You know, especially what we've learned about head injuries. Uh, but that night, as I prepared... With the day before, or the day of, when I prepared to leave, I wrote a handwritten last will and testament uh, in case things didn't work out like I'd hoped. And I remember I wrote about this in my book, showing up at Center Stage Theater, and there was like an aura of darkness surrounding me. And Dusty came up and he said, you don't have to do this. Even though the whole angle was you know, predicated on taking a powerbomb. And I said, I, I, I feel like I have to and I want to. And Leon did take care of me. He did. But that's not what I assumed was going to happen. I assumed I was going to take that. He more or less brought me up and dropped me as opposed to driving me. And I still had a concussion, you know? I still temporarily lost uh, a little bit of feeling in my feet and fingers. And uh, Janie Engel gave me a ride home and I, uh, I uh, started to pull over on the highway. I puked all over the highway, which is a clear sign of a concussion. concussion. And in trying to you know stay up through the night, which was what you did, I got a call from Harley Race, and he, he sounded like he may have had a couple of beverages, and he, and he was checking up on me, and I said, do you think it went well, Harley? He goes, it could not have gone any better if we'd done it a hundred times. It's a great Harley And then impression. the last, thanks, and the last thing he said before he hung up, he said, kid, you are the new Harley Race. So for anyone who wanted to, you know, uh, and I disparage is probably too strong a word, but you know, minimize what I did, and you know my abilities. That made up for it. You've got Harley Race saying you're the new Harley Race kid, and that meant the world to me, really did. So let's talk about this interview. Uh, Jim Ross is going to interview you in Tulsa. Uh, interview you as mankind. And this is where mankind said, as you said, dude was just a kid who wanted to make the people happy. Uncle Paul had ruined him, left mankind to pick up the pieces. Slaughter comes out as the commissioner and says he won't sanction the match for mankind's own safety. So, of course, down goes Slaughter with the mandible claw. But as a kid who used to hike to the matches, being in any sort of physical angle with Sergeant Slaughter had to be a pretty cool deal. Sergeant huh? Slaughter was kind of my end of the business. Yeah. Did we talk about this in a few in a past episode? I don't think so. The deal was '85. I'm a huge fan. Uh, wrestling's coming to my old high school where my dad is the athletic director. My dad mentions to the promoter Tommy D that his son wants to get involved, and Tommy says that if I go to the match, he'll talk to me. And uh, it was part what led to that being more than just a one-off is partially the fact that I had brought a bunch of my VHS tapes for the wrestlers to watch. So we had, you know, now we're in an era where you can just Google something, YouTube, you can watch anything from anywhere. But at that time, the guys in the business didn't see their matches. They were on the road so much. I mean, some people had VCRs, but it was hard to come by, uh, especially the garden matches, which were like, the, you know, that was the, pinnacle for WWE. It was like their pay-per-views. Those monthly garden shows were the pay-per-views before there were pay-per-views, where yes. everyone wanted to be, is where the best payoffs were. And here I am with a couple years worth of garden matches that I taped each and every month. And among those things, uh, this is where it pays to be nice. I was always nice to the sophomores when I was a senior. And although I wasn't like the center of attention, I was kind of a cool offbeat guy and I was always nice to people. Uh, I, I, I never pranked people, I never hazed people. And so I was over with the kids who were now seniors and athletes and word had spread about this dude love thing we had done. 
And they were like, do you have your match? And I went, uh, yeah. And they were all getting out of uh, would have been spring sports, right? This is March, so it's technically winter, but it's considered spring sports. They're all getting out, and word gets around these high school seniors that Mick Foley has the, the, her, the tape they've only heard about. And so you talk about playing to your audience. They're cheering everything I do, these uh, high school seniors. And I turn around and I, I see Tommy D, and he's just like, like he's made this amazing discovery not realizing I had this much athletic ability and I was in front of this perfect crowd. And it was at that point that he put me on his ring crew. How about that? So that was a major step. The other one was that Sergeant Slaughter's manager was there at the time. and He asked me if I had the means to get matches to Sarge. And so I went out and rented another tape deck, did the whole tape to tape thing. And uh, Sarge was, he was arguably the biggest non-WWE name in the wrestling world at that time. And he had a point, it looked like he might be approaching Hogan. And he left over the ability to merchant. G.I. Joe. Yeah, G.I. Joe. He wanted that. We say a lot of nice things about Mr. McMahon, all deserved, but he is a micromanager, doesn't necessarily want to give up anything like that. So Sarge went his way. And I ended up getting front row tickets to what they called Star Cage at uh, the Meadowlands. And uh, transferred, handed Sergeant Slaughter these tapes. And uh, my high school girlfriend, the one, uh, <laughs> my college girlfriend, the 1985 yes. first love girlfriend, prior to the 88 condom crumbling in yes. the island of Dominica, she actually had over her bed the you know the black and white Sarge sign, take care of Mick, and that's an order, Sergeant Slaughter. And so Sarge, and she did. She did. I, I, <laughs> and she did. did. Her, yes, she did. I'm hoping she's not listening, but if she is, yeah, she did, she did take care yeah. of. Her, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was. So now here I am. Twelve years have passed, and I'm in the ring giving my finishing Fantastic. hold to Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah, I do know this is not to badmouth Sergeant Slaughter at all, but to admire him because I said to somebody backstage one time, I said, "I don't know what Sergeant Slaughter's job is, but I want it." Yes. Sarge would open up his day planner and spend hours just perusing his day planner, and then he had good, neat height handwriting, so he write, write down the matches on the uh, whiteboard. And that was it. He would be there a whole day, never saw anyone look at his day planner to the extent that uh, Sarge did. But, and he was very rarely on screen as the authority figure. He was the, he was the commissioner, but he was very rarely on screen. He was the commissioner, right? Yes. Because Shawn Michaels took over for him, I took over for Shawn. I think that's the way, the lineage. I think that's how it went. Is there a lesson to learn there? Um, be polite, be on time, flow, fly below the radar? Because Sarge had to figure it out, didn't he? Yeah, to figure it out. But I also believe before Vince Sr. died that his wish was for a handful of people to be taken care of. Yeah. And Sarge was one of them. There you go. So you wind up working um, some street fight matches uh, through Long Island with Davy Boy. Uh, then you're going to go to a Middle East tour on the 29th and 30th. You'll work with uh, Jim Neidhart each night. You've told us this is where you realized, boy, this summer dude love thing. is over, brother. Not getting it. Anymore. I got to do 27 minutes with Jim Neidhart, and by the third or fourth time, I, or maybe sixth time, I was on that second rope going like this. I Dude-ing thought, it up. Summer of love is over. Yeah. To the company's credit, uh, I was supposed to uh, take part in a parade the next day, and they allowed me to fly home so that I could trick or treat with my children. Heckles that. I got there 10 minutes before uh, uh, they left to trick or treat. Dewey was in a vintage, no, when I say vintage, I, I mean it was made by uh, the same woman who made uh, uh, Terry, Terry Anderson. Yeah. Made his dude love outfit and I trick or treated as mankind with that cheap rubber mask. Nobody knew it was me. So Fantastic. I was mankind trick or treating as mankind, but I do remember that tour well. Uh, you get home to the States just in time for the Hershey Raw. Ahmed Johnson's going to come out for his match with Austin, but instead Kane comes out destroys Ahmed with a couple of th uh, tombstones 
and then you bend a steel rod on Kane's face, who sells it like he was shot, and then sits up like the Undertaker. Austin comes out, laughs at Ahmed, and uh, quite the sell job to make Kane look like he couldn't be destroyed. Um, you're a pretty big part of cementing Kane's legitimacy, right? Yeah. And at the Survivor Series in Montreal, of course, this is where we're going to get to the the ugliness of the the story and the situation. There's lots of rumors uh, in the week leading up to this. Uh, the internet is now really a, a part of wrestling in a bigger way than ever before. The Torch has a lot of comments. The Observer has lots of comments. There's lots of rumors on the different news sites. Brad even appears on Michael Landsberg. Everyone's talking as if we're about to see something big, but we don't really know what. But it feels like a seismic shift, the idea that Scott Hall, and as Razor Ramon, is now gone, and now he's in the NWO, and they're hotter than ever, and Hulk Hogan's a bad guy, and Diesel is gone, and so is the one, two, three kid, and it feels like one after another people are defecting. But Bret Hart had been really the uh, the face that runs the place mm-hmm. since Hogan left. And through all the lean years, the new generation years, and he's the face of the WWF. And the idea that I thought, he... I thought AJ was... Yeah, maybe. Maybe even before that. You know what? Just an aside. Um, AJ, uh, the house that AJ built, the man has very limited actual carpentry skills. Uh, yeah, I was Shoddy thinking Shoddy workmanship. That. Amazing rest. Okay, let's go back. Okay. Brett leaving and going to WCW. Did it? Would it? Just the idea of that. When you hear this is probably what's going to happen. This is the way it's looking. Did you feel like that was a much bigger blow than some of the others? Yeah, because he really defined that generation. Yeah. In WWE. Yeah, I don't think that's a loss any of us wanted to take on. No disrespect to Razor Ramon or Diesel, but they felt like supporting characters. Brett was sort of the lead role. Yeah. And the idea that you're losing the lead role after you lost the previous lead role, which was Hulk Hogan, right. feels like a major loss for the company. Did you as a member of the locker room feel it, feel that, or did you think, we got Undertaker, Austin's getting hot, and maybe it's an opportunity for me. Do you process that differently as a member of the locker room? Uh, yeah, maybe in some small way, I thought there might be something in it for me, but I, I'm a believer that uh, the rising tide lifts yes. all boats. Yes. And uh, I thought we needed Brett as our captain. I did. I thought we'd be okay, but I was getting tired of losing every week. You know, I mean, I'm taking a choke slam on the ramp in the hopes of helping build a character because I'm hoping this is a character that can be part of that nucleus yes that that leads us on um so i'm taking all this stuff seriously and uh a lot the loss of bret hart would be a big deal keep in mind though uh we've talked about in uh, previous episodes that i needed to keep focused yes and especially when the uh the wrestling newsletters were down on the uh on dude didn't yes. understand the evolution of the characters I don't think they understood that a guy was going out of his way to not be nearly as good as he could be. Yes. Um, I didn't, having my feelings hurt or my uh, confidence rattled wasn't going to lead to me being better. That was my feeling. I did not know how to use the internet. So I would not have been privy to a lot of the rumblings. So I, 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 at least I don't recall any rumblings because what ended up taking place was absolutely shocking to me. And this is coming from a guy who, who rode with and spent a lot of time with Owen. So let's talk a little bit about uh, just the way you're supposed to handle business, as they say. There's talk of Brett refusing to drop the belt to Sean here. And, of course, that comes out of the conversation where, I guess, once upon a time they had a conversation over the summer where Brett said, I just want you to know I'll have no problem doing business and dropping the belt to you. Because I know you'd do it for me. And Sean says, well, I'm glad to hear that, but I'd never do the same for you. So now, essentially, it's kind of, no, it's not F me, it's F you. I'm not doing it for you because you won't do it for me. And we're in a Mexican standoff. We're in a pissing contest now. And 
it's very rare that it gets to this point in wrestling. Usually there's some sort of cooler heads can prevail or I don't know, but it got to an ugly point. Did you feel the locker room was divided at that time? Or did you feel like most of the boys were with Brett and just saw Sean and this is a different Sean than now. Yeah, I always yeah, have to give yeah, a disclaimer. Yeah. Sean was just an asshole. I always liked Sean. <laughs> but I could see why. Uh, Did the locker room feel like they were more with Brett than Sean? Or was it again, divided? I don't know. I didn't know that much about. I, I don't want to go on record and say I, I heard Sean wouldn't put Brett over. But I don't know if I heard that before or afterward. Like I'm approaching this like I, my job is to have a good match and put Kane over, mm-hmm. you know. Be and again, I, I guess I did know there were some hard feelings because I was a little surprised. I thought it was a credit to both their professionalism that they were having a heck of a match and had such great chemistry. First five ten minutes in, I, I was feeling good because I had done what I was supposed to do, and that was put Kane over as strongly as I could. And you go back. In time, and you look at the choke slam he gave me from the ring apron to the table. Man, I got some good height. You know, I used that bottom uh, rope in a way that uh, most people did not see. You know, to get the couple extra feet that took that bump from being a good bump to a really good bump, and uh, and I was happy to do it. And now I'm going to sit back. I'm going to enjoy this show, and then things take a turn that I did not see coming. Uh, Meltzer said you guys went nine minutes and 29 seconds, you and Kane. And he says, they turned the house lights off of this match. So Kane's gimmick is he's wrestling in the dark, trying to get across the idea that it's in the bowels of hell. Mankind did an excellent job carrying him by taking big bumps on the steps. Kane worked as a monster most of the way until the finish when he took one big bump. Um, <clears throat> he liked the match. Uh, he thought it had... Uh, a good story, but he only gave it two stars. But it was what it needed to be. It was. What it did not need to be was a four-star match with all kinds of close false finishes. He, you had to get him over as a yeah. monster, and yeah. he did. Uh, it, it says here at the end, Mankind, quote-unquote, got up and crawled into the ring and was given the tombstone for the pin. So we're trying some different things. We're working with the lights being red. Uh, it's a different presentation, but, boy, they're trying everything they can to get this character over. And by they, I mean you, I mean, everybody's doing their thing, but you wrote in your book that really that's not even what's on your mind. That's almost secondary to, Hey, I forgot to bring my passport to Canada and you're concerned. What if I'm detained? And it was a pretty common occurrence with wrestlers usually because they maybe have something they shouldn't have (laughs) not because they forgot something yeah um at that time it was not absolutely essential to have your passport to go to canada okay but it did create problems and you're even going to wind up driving um 400 miles (laughs) uh and and in detroit owen's buddy ronnie offered to put you up at his his house in hamilton yeah and 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 we don't hear about this a lot but it is something that you've become sort of famous for old thrifty Mick Foley when given the opportunity rather than go rent a two-star hotel if I could just couch surf why not I didn't literally couch surf I spare bedroom surf okay and this was a good friend of Owens and I liked Ronnie in retrospect I shouldn't have I should always have a way to get around and this was what was clawing at me is uh in the aftermath and maybe it was a good thing, cause, because if I'd had my own car, I would have been out of there after that. I would have been on the long drive home, but I had no way to go anywhere. So I was just sharing a hotel room with, uh, with Kane after the fact. Now, we probably jump ahead to the actual incident and match and screw job. Hey, did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. And man, it's just gross. Miracle brand offers a whole line of self-cleaning eco-friendly bedding like sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. They also have self-cooling properties for better sleep quality. Using these silver infused fabrics originally developed by NASA, Miracle brand sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. So you get better sleep every night, y'all. 
It's also self-cleaning. These sheets are infused with natural silver that prevent 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. It's also going to give you some luxurious comfort and quality. You see, miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of some of those other luxury brands. And let me recommend it for the perfect holiday gift. Miracle sheets are the perfect gift for your spouse, your friends, or family. Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets. And since these come with three free towels, you'll get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. And oh yeah, it's better for your skin. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets mean less bacteria to clog your pores and fewer breakouts and other skin problems. Go to trymiracle.com slash Foley to try it today or give it as a gift to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% when you be sure to use our promo code Foley at checkout to save even more and get three free towels. And Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash Foley and use that code Foley to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Foley to treat yourself a friend or a loved one this holiday season. And we thank you miracle brand for sponsoring today's episode. Well, I want to talk about wrestling with shadows for a minute, yeah. because this is another thing that I feel like wouldn't have happened a year before, or even a year after a year prior, you know, we're, we're not sure about talking about the, the baby faces hugging the heels in the ring. And now we're going to show the behind the scenes of professional wrestling. We're going to show the undertaker on a freaking payphone. Uh, just things that we wouldn't normally see. Were you surprised that Vince went along with the idea of yeah. the filming for Wrestling with Shadows? I, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that type of access, because we just did our episode about Beyond, Beyond the, the Mat, Mat, but Beyond the Mat wasn't the first one to do it. Wrestling with Shadows was. Yes. Like unprecedented backstage access, yeah. it seemed like. Now, I do want to ask, you know, you're here in Montreal. It's a hot crowd. This Canada USA angle has been white hot. You know, there's been a personal issue. You, you know, through the, the, uh, telephone, telegram, telewrestler that Brett's going to be leaving. Did you know before the match went in the ring, what the finish was? I did not. And it was through watching wrestling with shadows. Brett thought it was going to be a schmoz, a schmoz. And he was good with that. He was going to show up on, he was going to give the title back. He wasn't going to throw it in the garbage. He was going to give it back. And uh, I had no idea that there had been a plan to relieve belt, uh, to relieve Brett unwillingly of the belt. Did, so not, not from watching the movie, just from locker room chatter, just from camaraderie amongst the boys. Did you know that Brett was going to? forfeit the title or did you not know any of the creative just figured, no. they'll figure it out i don't think i think what i may have done is i may have read the observer after the fact and found out that i was one of the guys that brett was willing to drop the title to mm -hmm. but i was kind of i uh, blissfully naive at the time so i didn't know anything more than what was uh, appearing before my eyes so you wrote in your book uh Brett labeled Sean as a co-conspirator of the title change, but if true, he did a good job of hiding it as he reached the backstage area. Quote, there's no way I'm accepting his fucking belt like this. This is bullshit. Now, of course, it's come out since Sean was in on it, mm -hmm. but just take me through. Is this a match that, I mean, we've heard the phrase sometimes, boy, it was a sellout at the curtain. All the talent who normally are trying to beat the traffic and get the hell out of here. They want to see what's going to happen with this one. Was this one of those matches or no? I don't recall the sellout feeling until after aftermath that everybody came around. Because there's a few places to watch the matches backstage. There's a talent viewing area. There's a talent viewing area. You know, the doctors. Monitors there's and gorillas. Probably five, six different uh, places. But it, everyone, Where were you? I was watching on what would be the predominant monitor watching it unfold 
because I could Owen was part of the Owen was part of the Hart Foundation. I couldn't have left before the match if so I wanted to. So your rides with Owen. Yeah, my rides with he's Owen. And he's standing in Gorilla with, with Bulldog ready right. to do a run-in yeah. for the Schmoz. Mm -hmm. So you're in maybe the talent viewing era. You've probably got your bag packed, ready to go when they're done. Yeah. And you see what happens. Are you as confused? Are you watching with the sound back there? I think so. Are you as confused as everyone else, or do you put together pretty quickly? I don't know if I knew what had happened. Like, I wrote, I didn't. I didn't think Sean was in on it based on his reaction. I remember. Um, you believed Sean. Yeah, and I remember uh, Julie Hart. Uh, she called. Somebody thought it was a work because Julie called Tr Triple H Hunter, and this, of course we call each other our gimmick names yes. all the time. Yes. Um, and it's, you know Hunter, no, no, it had nothing to do it. What I kept saying over and over is, you don't do that to Bret Hart. Yes. You don't do that to Bret Hart. And I wasn't thinking, hey, there's a list of people you could do that to. But I was just stunned that this had happened, and that this had gone down. Did part of you feel just selfishly, um, man, if they'd do this to Bret, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it has to, right? I think so. And this is where I don't want to, uh, I don't know the names but I know I wasn't the only one saying that I wouldn't be at TV the next day. Before we get there, you wrote in your book, the backstage area was also in a state of disbelief. Actually, a state of shock might be a more accurate description. I've been really upset by what I've just seen. Quote, you don't do that to a guy like Bret Hart. It's all I could say for minutes. I repeated it over and over, and I began to get angrier as time went by. How can they expect me to work here after this? I said to Pat Patterson who was also visibly upset by what had just transpired. I know, I know, said Pat Patterson, with tears welling up in his eyes. I can't believe it myself. I wasn't mad at Pat, but gave him a message to give to my, mall, my boss, who at that specific moment I detested. Tell Vince I'm not coming to work tomorrow. Several other wrestlers also echoed my sentiments about not wanting to work for the company. I saw Vince Russo, our head writer, who also looked greatly stressed, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, I said to Russo, without knowing that he'd been innocent of the deception. Russo later told me that those words hurt him more than anything he'd ever experienced. <laughs> I stormed out of the arena with Ronnie in tow. We got in the car, and I was not shy about letting my feelings known. I was not working for this damn company anymore, I spat out emotionally. Ronnie, for his part, was devastated, not only because he'd seen his hero's brother get screwed, but because he could sense his long anticipated wrestling road trip vacation was <laughs> falling apart. Cactus, please, he begged me. Think about what you're saying. I have thought about it, Ronnie. I shot back. I'm not going to work. And when I got to my hotel, I placed a series of phone calls. Now, before we talk about the phone calls, do you see Brett come backstage or any of the altercation with no, Vince? No. Uh, when, when you're with Ronnie, is it just you and Ronnie in the car or is Owen in the car with you? I think I would have gone out of my way to say Owen was there. So yeah. I think because of everything that happened, Owen ended up riding with uh, Brett. Brett or Davey. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, man, I was, I was reeling for sure. Do you remember any of the other boys having conversations with you? I know, uh, as the story goes, Undertaker wanted to know what happened. So he wanted to go talk to Vince. I think as some have told the story, Davey, who's supposed to be running out there for the schmoz, realizes what's happened and says something like, they fooked him. Uh, do you remember, and supposedly I think one of the other guys who said he wasn't coming back to work was Rick Rude, maybe another. Rick didn't. And Rick didn't. Went to Nitro. Yeah. Showed up on Nitro. But I think Road Warrior Hawk was like, I'm not doing this. I'm out of here. Do you remember any other reaction from any other talent in the building before you went to your hotel? Uh, no. No, I don't, it's almost like it was just a group of people, all of us upset, disappointed, angry, and uh, at least four or five people saying they weren't going to work. Can you kind of describe the vibe? I mean, you talked about in last week's episode, and you and I kind of experienced it a little bit in Nashville after Ric Flair's last match. There was just like this weird celebratory yeah. glow kind of, hey, things went cool and yeah. everybody had fun and it felt special. And you've talked about how that's the thing you missed the most with wrestling. Is this the most 
Is this the only time I ever felt like this? Is this the most unique or weird? Wow. Pillman's death, Draza's injury. This was this was different though because it wasn't just an accident. A sa yeah, sadness. Yeah, it was anger too. Mm -hmm. So we were angry and confused. I mean, I remember going back to you know going back to my room and uh, you know Glenn talking to his wife saying Mick really put me over strong, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I. I it was understood that he was just starting a character that he he, had, he he had to go to work. And now, if I'd had my car, if it, if it wasn't back in, I don't know why it was my rental. I had a rental car. I don't know why I drove with Ronnie. And I just I love spending time with Owen. Owen always busted on Ronnie. It made it fun. I had to believe I was coming back through that area because I did have a car, a rental car. Um, otherwise, I would have been gone. I would have been, you know, halfway to Atlanta by daybreak. Um, although I, I know I'd moved to uh, Florida by that point, Florida Panhandle. You think you would have started driving home yeah, from Montreal? Yeah, absolutely. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp, and I want to go ahead and give you a pop quiz here. Have you ever wished that life could come with a user manual? Wouldn't that be so much easier? Now, that was not the case for me. Uh, I found that I actually needed to talk to somebody back in 2006 I was going through a rough patch and I didn't feel like I could talk to my friends or family about it. I needed a third party. Now, these days I would recommend online therapy. It's basically the next best thing. And when I think about online therapy, I think about better help. You see, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck and navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change or a new relationship or becoming a parent, those are all really big deals. And it's okay to want to talk to somebody about it. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of these challenging emotions that you may be feeling and learn more productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to like a, a guided tour of the complex engine called you. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and man, it's accessible anywhere. It's 100% online. Again, I did this in 2006 and I wish that better help was an option for me back then. It just would have been a whole heck of a lot more convenient. And really, I think I would have been more comfortable. I think therapy is great for coping skills, self-empowerment. If you're dealing with trauma, I've benefited from therapy. And if you're not sure about it, buddy, I want you to try better help. I encourage you to give it a shot as the world's largest therapy service. Better help has matched more than 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists, it's all available 100% online. Plus it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It really couldn't be simpler. There's no waiting rooms. There's no traffic. There's no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Foley. That's better H E L P.com slash Foley betterhelp.com better h e l p.com slash foley so you write in your book because i was curious you know as we were thinking about doing this show like when you get because i knew where, where your stance was and i just thought well he probably called his wife first mm -hmm. she wrote in your book i called jim ross first first jim ross first i left a message that says tell vince i'm not coming to work i'm sick to my stomach and i don't feel like i can work here anymore if you have any questions, you can call me at the Quality Inn. Next, I dialed Brett, who was staying at another hotel. He wasn't in, but I left a message repeating my sentiments I'd explained to Ross and giving him my support. I then tried Owen's room and was relieved to find him in. What happened, I asked. Well, Owen said matter-of-factly, Vince walked into Brett's dressing room while Brett was getting changed. He apologized to Brett, but Brett told him, Vince, I'm going to take a shower, and if you're still here when I get out, I'm going to punch you right in the fucking mouth. Well, did Vince leave? I asked. No, Owen replied. He stared there the whole time while Brett was in the shower. What happened when he get out? I wanted to know. Brett walked up and punched Vince right in the mouth. He calmly <laughs> told me. Vince went down and Shane tried to help him get his wits and then they left. I wanted Owen to know that his family had my support. Owen, I'm not going to the show tomorrow and a lot of other guys aren't either. 
Vince is going to at least have to apologize tomorrow or he won't have much of a company. So you had to know that when you call Jim Ross, he's probably going to try to call and talk you out of it and to think about your family and your career and all that. What's going through your mind? I know that we know from just getting to know you over the years and certainly through the show, you're a principal dude, but at the same time, man, we got to take care of a wife and kids at home and you probably do have a contract. Was all of that going through your mind about? Nah, what was going through my mind was trying to do the right thing. Uh, and I, so I would have called my wife after I told Jim that I was leaving. Yeah. And she was supportive of me. Like she, okay, if I understand. If, even though we had the two small kids and we had the, the new house and the mortgage, she was supportive. I must have felt like I could have worked elsewhere, not knowing at that time the nature of the contract. And I can't remember whether I had the long talk with my wife Colette or the long talk with Jim Ross, but when I finished whatever talk that was, that red message light was blinking. That was from JR. No, it was from Vince. Okay. Well, in so I might be springing ahead. It might be. It might be. Might have been the message light ringing from JR after I talked to Colette, and then it ringing again with the message from Vince after I got off the phone with. Uh, you wrote in your book that you're talking to Kane, sort of saying, "Hey, man, I know you're just getting started. You've been in the business seven years, and you finally found a bankable yeah. character." I understand your yeah. position. And that's when you notice, oh, I got a missed call. The operator says, JR, return your call. And you talked to JR for what you said was quite a while. While not condoning what had just happened, he did try to explain the extenuating circumstances that surrounded it. Mick, you've got to understand that Vince only did what he thinks is necessary for this company's survival. I listened to everything he said, and a lot of it made sense. But nonetheless, my mind was made up. Tell Vince I'm not showing up. And that's how we finished the conversation. And you wrote that you called your wife and you were dead serious about leaving by this point. Um, and she says, well, I guess I'm behind you then before you guys said your goodbyes. And then you notice the message light is on again. And this time, uh, it's a message from the operator saying, Mr. Foley and Mr. McMahon called and wants you to call him back. And you said, oh God, Decane, Vince called. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't think I can handle talking to him right now. I lay awake for a long time that night just thinking about the events of the evening. I couldn't help but think that Vince, who had just been punched in the face, had thought enough of Mick Foley to call him when he heard my decision. At this point, I was cursing myself for having even ridden with Ronnie. Without him, I would have caught the last flight out of Montreal flight. to anywhere okay. flight. and been okay. gone. Because of him, my rental car was in a garage that I couldn't find, and I was completely dependent on him to bring me back to my car in Hamilton. Ronnie was intent on traveling to the next two shows, even though a Hart family from a Hart family perspective, the tour is over. Uh, so while the rest of the crew left for TV in Ottawa, I stayed behind in my hotel in Montreal. So let's talk about the call from Vince. You said it meant a lot to you did given everything that had happened. And he just got punched in the face that he still called, but you couldn't call him back. I wish I had, you know, um, I mean, I'd done a lot of standing up. Were you just <laughs> emotional at that moment? I, I was really emotional and I, I, for whatever, I don't know. I don't know. I just didn't feel like I could deal with that. I dealt with a lot. I wish I could say, yeah, I got on the phone and called him right back. It did surprise me because I did not think I was important enough to receive a call from Vince under those circumstances. So looking back on it, it's like, wow, that was really impressive. It struck me right away. It was impressive that he called me after what he'd been through. And I, I guess I wasn't ready for that, for that phone call. The next day, you wrote that you had nothing to do but think. So you thought a lot. I still couldn't believe what had happened the night before, but hoped somehow things would work out. When Vince saw his depleted crew, he would be forced to fix things, and then I would be happy to rejoin the Federation. I began thinking about my decision to leave and realized that quitting the company amounted to a breach of my mm -hmm. contract, and I would forfeit any monies that were due to me. I didn't mind sitting out for a year, but I didn't want to lose the money I'd already worked for. If I left with no notice, I would be out three months of pay-per-view, six months of royalties, and one month of arena shows, 
That gave me cause to think about giving a three months notice so I could at least get what was rightfully mine. Still, an apology or a rectification of the situation by Vince would make things a whole lot easier for me. And I watched Raw with great anticipation that night, but was devastated to see that instead of admitting their mistake, the WWF was actually playing it up. They were mocking Brett, and I was disgusted. One by one, I saw wrestlers appear on the screen who told me only one night earlier they wouldn't be working anymore. I realized I had absolutely no pull. It was the difference between robbing a store with a real gun and robbing a <laughs> store with a water pistol. My show of rebellion just wasn't going to work. Surprisingly, the telecast had nothing but positive comments about mankind. And later that night, I received a call from Jim Cornette, and we talked for close to two hours. He made me see that even if none of us approved of what Vince had done, he had to understand that he did what he felt was best for the company. WCW was hell-bent on destroying Vince by any means necessary, and when it came to Vince McMahon, Ted Turner did indeed have very deep pockets. I had seen the WWF Women's Champion show up on Nitro with her belt and throw it in the garbage. It wouldn't be beneath WCW to offer Brett a couple hundred extra grand to do it as well. The Federation had always been able to make its world title mean something, and without it, there would be a gigantic hole. Finally, my decision came down to money. I respected Brett, and I liked him a great deal personally but I had to feel like he was going to be all right. He was going to be making about 2 million a year to fall back on. Meanwhile, I would have nothing. I just kept thinking of those figures, 2 million to zero, zero to 2 million with great reservation. I showed up at TV tapings the following afternoon. So before we talk about what happened there, I, I just want to take back, take you back to that day. The train goes on. The traveling circus continues. They all leave without you. They go to the, the next show you just hang out in the hotel and yeah. watch the show on tv by yourself in another country maybe thousands of miles from your family yeah is this the most maybe alone and confused you felt in wrestling where a concussion wasn't involved maybe so yeah well, definitely confused uh you know everyone deals with sadness on the road and i've said that you know getting injured physically is almost a sure thing but getting your heart broken repeatedly is absolutely guaranteed in wrestling, unless you don't love it to begin with. Then it's different. But for those who love it, yeah, prepare to get your heart broken time and time again. So I'd been through those moments, but just confusion like this. Uh, re when they, I believe they started out the show with, uh, you know, where they bring out the, the, the little, little person. person dressed as Brett. And I was like, this isn't the apology I, I was hoping for. And Rick Rude did not have a contract. He was, you know, coming back on a date, at least I think, you know. Uh, when really, you see the little person show up, do you wonder if Russo was telling the truth? No, nah, that didn't cross my mind. No, I'm not trying yeah. to throw shade yeah. on Russo. I think a lot of Vince Russo. I'm just saying he's the writer of the doggone show. And so for you to have a little jacket and a little hitman and all that lined up the next day, it does feel like... Mm, now, I'm not saying he was in on it. I am just saying you have to be a little disappointed. And I want to talk about this for a minute. Because on the one hand, we all agree, well, Vince screwed Brett. But at the same time, it felt like you were reaching out maybe to some of your other co-workers. And there's this band of brothers. And, hey, we're going to stand in solidarity. And we're not going to stand for this. And then one by one, they parade across yeah. the TV screen. And you, you have to feel a little let down, a little oh, betrayed maybe. Yeah, or let down for sure. Let down for sure. If it wasn't for the fact that guys were s verbally uh, expressing their anger and saying they weren't coming, yeah, this, I wouldn't I'm have expected here, it. All that. But yeah, I did sit there in that hotel room and I, I saw the little person come out and I just. Yeah, Hunter took a shot. I know Hunter runs the place, but I'd seen his reaction the night before, and I thought maybe there'd be a little bit of... And you thought, that's not consistent. That's not consistent, consistent with him saying, we knew Brett had little charisma, something about along those lines. Uh, but I didn't know he was... It was yeah. It was really sad to me, but by the end of the show, I realized I got a wife and two kids... I breached my contract. I mean, those contracts at the time were so one-sided. Of course. You were guaranteed $150. So you didn't think about the contract stuff until after the show? Yeah. So during the Maybe day... Maybe I don't want to say that because I might be quoting the book saying something different. 
I don't know if it crossed, I don't know when it crossed my mind, but it definitely became my primary focus when I realized, uh-oh, there's nobody there. Like one really is the loneliest number. <laughs> uh, Curious, I, were you watching Nitro at all? Because, you know, they came out with little Canadian flags. No, no, I wasn't. Okay. I don't think I was, at least. Not in a way that would have, you know, you know, not in the way that was memorable to me. I think I was just dead set on watching WWE and watching this unfold and just feeling like it was just so disrespectful. And uh, because it does, uh, look, uh, the one time, the most tense moment I had with Vince uh, ever was when I had given my notice as an announcer and he yeah. told me to, you know, uh, I'm asking you to stick it out. And I said, what's the, like, what's the message here that if I, uh, do this for 10 years and become as good as I possibly can that you're going to treat me like you treat JR. And he looked that at me the wrong and, thing to and say. he said, you think I've been bad to him? I said, I think you've made his life more difficult than it needs to be. That The, the same way I felt like, well, if you're going to treat Jim Ross that way as an announcer, what does that say about me? Yeah. So the feeling I had was, if you're going to treat Bret Hart that way, None of us are beyond uh, beyond that. So it was, man, it was a sobering time. It really was. But like I, going back to those contracts, when I said 150, that's not quite true. You were guaranteed 150 dollars a night for five nights. Right. So you had a con, you had a guarantee of 750 dollars a year, which is insane. Yeah. This is when they were selling the uh, idea of not giving guarantees. We but give opportunities. opportunities. And you know, many is the person who, you know, whose career didn't work out like they'd hoped, and uh, you never, rarely seen or heard from again because five years is a long time to languish. Um, and once I realized that's what I was looking at, you know, it comes down to the children and your wife, and uh, so you had you had five years on your due. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. It may have been three. It may have been three. But whatever it was. Either way, it's a long it's a long time to sit out and do nothing. Were you thinking maybe there's a way to get out of it? I could do some maybe Japan, I could do Japan. Some ECW. I was thinking IWA, ECW. Yeah, exactly, IWA, ECW. Um, but I did, you know. But you didn't even turn on Nitro. That wasn't even a thought. I don't think so. Wow. Yeah. Hey guys, listen up. I know these days when you watch the news, it feels like it's one hit after another, and it's all bad news for the economy. Well, let me give you some good news. It's not all that bad when it comes to real estate. Let me explain. You see, a year ago, man, real estate was hot, hot, hot. Everybody and their brother was trying to go out and buy another house. What did that mean? It was so competitive that a lot of folks got discouraged. So let me ask you, have you thought about buying a house in the last couple of years, but Maybe you just couldn't win a bid. I used to hear that all the time. Well, now is the time to buy. Yes, interest rates have creeped up a little bit, but what that's created is an opportunity for you. A year ago, it wasn't uncommon for there to be more than a dozen offers on a home, many of which were over list. That is not the case today. So if you got discouraged once before about trying to buy a new house, now's the time to take another look. Now, yes, interest rates have creeped up a little bit, but you're not going to overpay for the home, but here's what you will do. You'll stop throwing your money away on rent and now you'll get a greater tax deduction. That's right. You see at the end of the year, you're going to get a statement from your mortgage company that shows how much interest you paid and you get to write all of that interest off. That means you could get a huge tax deduction. You never get that as a renter. Not only that homes are still going up in value. Don't believe the hype. All of the economists believe long-term real estate always works out. Let me give you an example. Maybe way back when, in the housing collapse of 2008, you bought in 2007 and maybe overpaid. Buddy, if you hung in there, that house is worth a whole heck of a lot more now. If you've played in the stock market, you know what I'm talking about. You only lose money when you throw in the towel. Real estate long-term always performs well. So here's my advice to you. Date the rate, marry the house. Find the house that you and your family love long-term, because here's what's not long-term these higher rates. I've yet to see a single economist who doesn't agree with me that rates are going to return. So doesn't it make sense to get the house you want right now? And then when rates improve, man, just get a lower monthly payment. In the meantime, you'll enjoy a greater tax deduction and that property is going to continue to appreciate, meaning you're building equity and wealth for yourself. Not only that, how about this? We're going to save you some cash at buywithconrad.com. 
We're going to give you the peace of mind of a seven-year guarantee. When rates improve over the next seven years, not if, but when, that's my prediction, we'll refinance you again with no new origination points. Think about that. That could save you thousands of dollars and give you the peace of mind of knowing that you got the right house for your family right now. And then when the rates improve, man, get a lower monthly payment. Now you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but you do need to hurry to buy with Conrad.com. That's the first step. You tell us how much you want to put down and what you want your monthly payment to be. We get you approved and then you go shopping just like a cash buyer at buy with Conrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Seriously, if you've thought about buying a house over the last couple of years, but you got discouraged, now's the time to take another look. Let me run the numbers for you right now. You'll be glad you did at buywithconrad.com. Woo Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavyweight champion. Tell them, Nate. Woo Wings, legendary flavors, world championship wings. Woo! Woo Wings. Yeah! Woo Woo! So uh, of all the people who could have called you, certainly you're shocked that Vince called, uh, but you didn't want to talk to him. I know we're going to talk about your meeting with him, but were there two better people to call you than Jim Ross and Jim Cornette? Because no. you had relationships right. with both of those guys. Yeah, and they knew me personally. They knew how I felt about things. Uh, you know, v Vince always respected my point of view, even if he disagreed with it. You know, across the spectrum, wrestling, world events, what have you. Uh, I, it wasn't like it was a foolish impulse. It was, I mean, it was a pretty strong feeling I had. We know uh, that there's been a lot of criticism over the years of Vince where people would say he surrounds himself with yes men. But we've also heard that Vince really likes when you stand up to him. Yeah. Do you think Vince respected that you were the, the lone gun who stuck for their guns? I like to think so. Yeah. I can't remember if he said that because I know we're going to jump ahead uh, probably to the reaction. But the reaction was, uh, I can't remember if he shook my hand or hugged me and it was never referred to again. But I do, did I say in there that I thought he respected it in uh, my book? I know the hearts did. I know I even got a, a, a little Christmas card and Julie said she appreciated my little... When you show up to TV the next day, do you go straight away and talk to anyone right away? Does someone seek you out, or is it just uh, business as usual? Can't remember. Was it Messina, New York? I'm not sure. Uh, it was. It, it was either Messina, New York, or right across the river from Messina. For those who don't know the geographic outlay, only a little river separates New York State from Canada. Did you feel like? The conversation, the way Jim Ross and Bruce Pritchard and Jim Cornette have explained this over the years was he was doing what he could to protect the company. And I certainly get that. I do. Because in the end, a lot of people thought it was Vince versus Eric Bischoff, but it wasn't Eric's money. It was Ted's money. Yeah. And Ted had more money. Right. And... Bruce has talked about there were times that things were so lean that all of the quote unquote wrestling people got their income cut in half. They pulled the water coolers out of the building. Kevin Kelly, a few years ago said that they recommended sharpening your pencils instead of getting new ones and turning the <laughs> lights off after you left the room after the bathroom or whatever. So things were really lean. And, and, and Bruce even says on the podcast that there were years where Vince would say, I had to pull $6 million out of my ass, meaning he wrote a check for it. The company was losing money. So I understand Vince's position in his own mind. But in reality, didn't Vince kind of create this? In that he gave a contract he couldn't honor. He allowed a talent to go negotiate for a new contract. And he did so while the guy was still champ, Vince kind of created this circumstance, did he not? 
Or he at least allowed it. Vince screwed Vince. He did. I, it's crazy now, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about the billion dollar Peacock deal and, yeah. you know, uh, the stock options and how well people have done since then. But uh, we talked a little bit about money. And, you know, look, I think I said in my book what I made, you know, is like, I think I made about 350 grand for a full year in a good spot. For WWE, that's before nothing. Before road expenses. Before road expenses, before taxes, all that, and that's nothing to sneeze at, even now. But it's right? hundred grand. But uh, yeah. A change. Um, yeah, it's it's tough to build your future. I was looking for that four hundred grand year. That would be the hallmark. So I wasn't that disappointed with three fifty. But looking back at what some minor role players make over the past few years. It's cr- it's really crazy. Yeah, you and I've heard some contract yeah. numbers that are just astronomical right, by comparison. Right. And I'm not, and I and uh, I'm I'm the I'm not begrudging people who sure. are making that, especially if they're really performing. But there are some really minor players, especially, and this is where th- that whole idea of AW and the rising tide lifts all boats. If they're throwing ridiculous money at people to not wrestle, just basically to stay home guys making more you know to stay home than i did in 97 to work part of that time with you know still with the the, the bad back uh you know being away from my family for probably 250 days out yeah. of that year is looking back on it like i guess they re- I, I was i was happy financially because i was making over double what i made in wcw, WCW. i was being used well uh, and none of us foresaw the future. None of us. If you had told me in 1997 that 25 years later I'd be signing no, you wouldn't this believe it. vinyl figure with a large head and that I would be able to make more money at a convention than I made in a month on the road, that's, that's craziness, yeah. you know? None of us saw YouTube, saw any of these. The uh, whole business is changed. Right. Uh, to get paid to sit down, and this is really a thorough, I think we provide a valuable. Yes. You know, it's, it's you know, we're coming in here and I make the little trip into the studio so it can be as good as it can be. But I didn't know this. Right. I, I didn't know that I'd be making more money on my WWE royalties in 2022 than I was making in 2000. You know, or 97, there was very little. I think I had my first action figure come out in 96, and I thought, okay, I'm done as far as action figure goes. So none of us knew that. Uh, we, I remember Steve Austin talking about going in for his, uh, his contract negotiation, and uh, I went, no, I had just resigned in April 97, and I did, I had resigned because I, res- I'm sorry for the, I had resigned, resigned, because Steve and I were kind of like each other's... Barometer. Barometer. And... Um, Going back to Mark Merrow in 96. Mark Merrow in 96, so that I happened to have met with Vince the day after I did those interviews with Jim Ross in yes. April of 97. Yes. So I did have a guarantee. I'm sorry for... I did have a guarantee, but I was walking out on that guarantee, which was pretty good. And I remember I, I brought up that four hundred thousand dollar thing to Vince, and uh, we didn't quite hit that as a guarantee, as evidenced by the fact I did not make four hundred grand in nineteen ninety seven. But he said uh, he thought it stacked up, you know, with what he'd uh, he'd offered Steve. Well, the way I know, or the way I interpret, that Vince appreciated that you stood up to him. As you wrote in your book, that your payoffs for that raw taping you did show up to was very large. Yeah, yeah. That's a little way that they, yeah, they show they care. Last part of your book uh, about this, you wrote, Apparently Brett had really appreciated the gesture of respect that I had made and made mention of it in several interviews I read. WCW was a gold mine waiting uh, in Brett, but not surprisingly failed to take advantage of it. Within months, due to office politics and creative differences, Brett was just another one of the guys. They literally wasted one of the greatest performers in the business, the Federation, and on the other hand, used the strange event as the catalyst for greater things and ratings and ideas. 
the real life screwing of Bret Hart was used as a springboard for Mr. McMahon, this evil character, the persona that helped propel the company to greater success than once was even thought possible. And the renegade Stone Cold Steve Austin persona now had the perfect foil to play off in, cor in the corporate scumbag Mr. McMahon and the house show attendance took off immediately. And I think everybody kind of agrees that Brett and WCW was just a fumble. It could have been so much bigger. It could have been so much more special. Should have been. Um, it's a shame that he didn't get to finish his career here in the company. And we've often talked about sort of the what ifs. Yeah. Maybe it felt like he had to pick because of the infighting with Brett and Sean. He had to pick one. He went with Brett. Sean winds up getting hurt in January, just two months later at the Royal Rumble. He's out just two months after that at WrestleMania. He's done for several years. What if maybe Sean would have went to the NWO or went to WCW and Brett stuck around through the Attitude Era? Or what if Owen hadn't accidentally dropped Steve? Steve could have very easily slid in as the opponent at Survivor Series and beat Brett and everything could have yeah. been different, but none of that happened. And instead it was this, and I'm curious, you know, when you show up to that raw taping, you've thought about your family, but you show up, do you feel like a sellout? Do you feel like you have compromised your morals? Do you feel weird about it? Are you keeping to yourself or is it just business as usual? Cause you sort of crossed that bridge mentally and now it's about taking care of the family. I didn't. I did not feel like a sellout because I felt like I had done everything that was in my power. Yeah. That the only way I was going to make a difference is if there was uh, a show of a strength in numbers situation, and there was no strength because there were no numbers. And so, I'll tell you what else is going through my mind as you read that. I'm a hell of a writer, huh? Yeah. To to put that seriously. No doubt. At the time I wrote that book, no celebrities were writing their own book. You know, right. I mean, there may have been a, an odd actor or two, but it was very few and far between. Certainly, no athletes were. And uh, to think that I had the ability to sit down, uh, having not written anything of substance in many years, <laughs> and put that pen to paper, literally pen to paper, yeah, I really I think that holds up well. Great question here from Aaron on Twitter. He wants to know if Vince screwed you on live TV, would you have knocked him out? Now, I don't know the, I don't know if that's the right question, yeah. but what would you have done if you put yourself in Brett's shoes and maybe there's a, a fun idea where, Hey, maybe we give you a double arm DDT and then there's a fast count and wait, that wasn't the plan. What happens next? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I don't know. If I, I, fortunately, I was never put in that situation. Uh, I have to imagine Brett packs a wallop. Yeah. You know, and Vince knew it was coming. Yep. I think Brett thought, I think Brett expressed that almost everyone thinks this is going to end up with pushing and shoving and a schmoz, and he knew that. So he led with the, the right, and I don't think Vince was expecting that. Um, there are other story, you know, I mean, other people have other perspectives. Uh, Vince knew he was going to take a shot. Like he was putting himself in a position to take that shot. Yes. I don't think he realized how quickly it was going to come. Yeah. Uh, and the one thing that I think, um, Vince asked was that they not show him needing help on, uh, on Brett's film. That that's you you know this is the same guy who slid into a ring somehow tore both quads and still tried to stand up still tried to stand up and then cut a promo in the ring after having torn both quads like yeah. he's not a big fan of human frailty yeah and so he didn't want anyone to see him needing help like that yeah um, so man what a what a strange. What a strange night, strange aftermath, but no question it led to that character, uh, which uh, only further fueled an already super hot Stone Cold Steve Austin. Right. Became the perfect foil for him. Uh, and I really benefited from that Mr. McMahon character as well. You know, Mankind played off Mr. McMahon. It, it was really a super boost of adrenaline 
for the company, created a direction. Um, I don't know if that excuses what went down that night, uh, but certainly they made the best of out of a difficult situation. It's a weird parallel to draw, but do you think that was further evidence that maybe, you know, everybody's saying, I'm not taking this anymore, I'm out of here. Is that further evidence that unionizing wrestling would be very difficult? It would be really difficult. Yeah, because the guys who stand to, uh, the, the guys who stand to, to benefit the least are the guys you need uh, the most. Yes. And, uh, and I, I talked to Eric Bischoff at some length, and uh, he explained that, you know, we would lose some of the things that we take for granted, which is the ability to work indies. Uh, all of a sudden you'd be in a situation where you can only work for a show that has um, um, union union workers setting yes. up the ring. You know, we always disparage the state athletic commissions. They basically show up and take a lot of money to do nothing. Every Every show would have to have that. And you'd be in a situation where guys would be like, wait, what do you mean? There's no, I can't do any of these shows? So you'd pretty much say goodbye to independent wrestling. Uh, and I mean, it, it was, you know, Eric's a pro business guy and he's, uh, you know, he's been on that other end that, that I haven't of the business end of the wrestling business. And that's why I, I've thought, okay, you know, the secret is AFTRA, like we should all be part of SAG and AFTRA. Yes. And uh, no question. You're, uh, you're on American TV Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Absolutely. Screen actor. Yeah, we're on a screen. Every week. Every week. And I asked Barry Bloom, and Barry says there's just not enough numbers to make it worth them fighting for. Because at any given time, there's what? 150 yeah. full time wrestlers? Not a thousand. There's not, yeah, I mean, in. <sighs> Look, I, I don't want to ever say anything negative about Bret Hart. Right. But I know in my heart that my cameos are better than this. 100%. And I bring that up because there are 7,500 athletes yes. on cameo. Yes. 7,500 athletes. Nobody have as many but, pop stars. But, I'm, but I'm talking specifically about, well, there's only 150 of us full time? Yeah. Only 150, there's 7,500 athletes, on all cameo. of whom had some type of uh, um, union behind them. Right. On, you know, and here we are, the wrestlers, the 150 of us, how are you going to go pick out the guys who are working in Japan, right. the guys doing indies? And so Eric impressed upon me that as much as I'd like there to be a union, that it could really hurt the business by giving guys who were not among those 150 nowhere to work because now they'd be scabs. Right. They'd be showing up in non-union work. And when you sign that Screen Actors Guild, you promise not to do anything that's not SAG. You know, I know they've form, you know, uh, melded with uh, AFTRA, uh, but it kills me that I don't make enough money uh, any year to get their good insurance. You know, I mean, I should be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's easier said, it's easier said than done. Yeah. It's easier said than done. Any final words about the Montreal screw job or have we covered it all? I think we did a pretty good job. I mean, this took me back to another, that was a really difficult time. Yeah. Really difficult time. Sometimes in life you do have to swallow your pride and uh, especially if you, you know. I gotta tell you, uh, John Walton wasn't always treated well uh, on the Waltons. Yeah. Sometimes, if you remember from the homecoming, he had to work 20 miles away and catch a bus nearly missed Christmas. He would have rather been home for his family. Of course. But he had to do what he had to do. And so, you know, I guess that's my defense is that in the end, I did what I thought I had to do. And that's what Vince did as well. And Brent obviously didn't hold it against you. Uh, I mean, his family <laughs> continued to work for the company. And, yeah. You know, speaking of doing uh, what you got to do, we're going to talk about that next week because you did what you had to do. For the IWA King of the Death. Oh, wow. We're going to take a deep dive into IWA? 
I uh, I can't wait to talk about the highlights, the lowlights, <laughs> all the in between. That's really the first tape. Uh, you know, I mean, when you talk about tape trading, yeah, that had to be the most trafficked tape of all time. I'm trying to think in my point. head how much I made off that tape. Zero. 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 We'll talk about that and a lot more. Of course, he can make a few bucks these days uh, over at cameo.com forward slash uh, Mick Foley. And I want to mention, hit the subscribe button, hit the like, throw us a five star if you think we've earned it. If you've got a question for the program, including about the IWA King of the Death Match, you can ask it over at Foley is Pod. If you want to introduce the wrestling fan in your life to the show and maybe you want to just give him an appetizer. Tell them about our YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Turn on the notifications at youtube.com forward slash Foley is pod. He's on Twitter at Real Mick Foley. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad. And we'll see you guys next week right here on Foley is pod. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs>